Um, thank you very much. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Dahio Kelly, uh, Chairman of the UK Group here in the Institute. Uh, this panel, where are we and where are we going? We've got three very distinguished speakers and I hope that I know a little bit more at the end of this session than I do at the moment. So might I first invite Lucinda Creighton to address us. Uh, um, I'm, I'm <coughs> I would come here because okay. some people down there may not be able to see. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I'll keep my introductory remarks short, I think, because uh, I think it's much more interesting to get into the panel discussion and the, the questions. Um, I think um, my friend uh, Neil summed it up uh, when he said that, you know, sort of the more that happens in these Brexit negotiations, um, the more things stay the same, um, plus ça change. Um, and uh, I think we've seen that over the last you know, two plus years where um, despite, you know, um, grand statements, announcements, new plans um, and multiple European councils and summits, um, we actually aren't a whole lot further along than where we started from. There is enormous uncertainty um, about where this is going to end up. Um, I don't think there are too many people in the room who could, um, who could really make a, a certain uh, prediction. Um, and I suppose in the sphere that I spend most of my time in these days, um, in the commercial world, working with business who are trying to navigate this and understand where we are, um, they have absolutely zero certainty. Um, they are scrambling to prepare themselves. It's slightly easier, I think, for, for multinationals and for larger corporates, but for small and medium-sized enterprises, um, they just have no idea what's going to happen um, come the 29th of March 2019. Um, they're trying to prepare, but, but the, the cost implications of um, those preparations are quite great. Um, and, so, um, and so there is a, a lot of concern and, uh, and deep worry. Um, in terms of the positions, I suppose, from the, from the, the two negotiating sides, um, I mean, we've seen consistent consistency, which I think nobody could have anticipated two years ago from the EU side. We have seen a complete unity of purpose. Uh, we've seen um, absolute clarity in terms of the, the priorities, the intentions, and I suppose, and the bottom line of the EU side. Um, and um, that has been, I suppose, from an Irish perspective, very welcome, um, because it has ensured that uh, the Irish question of the border um, and the future of the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process has been to the forefront. And tactically, um, and you know, in politics we are always talking about <coughs> tactics, um, that has been a, a, a smart position from the Irish government um, and one which was completely underestimated by the UK negotiators. Um, so at every stage throughout this process, uh, any time, in, I'm in London probably two, three times, next week I'm in London three times um, separately, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I'm in London a lot, um, and every time I speak to uh, colleagues, um, either um, from my um, political contacts or in the business world, they just can't comprehend this. And at every stage they have underestimated this uh, sort of solidarity and this, um, um, this um, sense of um, belonging and, and togetherness um, um, amongst uh, the EU and particularly towards Ireland. It doesn't solve our problem though because no country potentially will be impacted by no deal uh, at the end of this process as much as we will. Um, so there's a huge threat um, from a bilateral trade point of view and a huge threat to multiple sectors in this country which, um, which I don't believe we're prepared for. Um, it's very difficult to prepare. Um, there's so much the government can do, there's so much the businesses can do, but ultimately if it occurs um, and if it looks likely to occur um, as, the, as the next few weeks go on, uh, we will certainly have to ramp up our, our planning. Um, as I said on the UK side, um, you know, this is an, a, a negotiation which is characterised by and um, this hallmark has been um, a, an internal negotiation. So this is um, elements of the Conservative Party and elements of British politics negotiating with each other uh, rather than negotiating bilaterally with the European Union. And this is why we have not progressed. Um, yes, we've made progress on some of the less contentious issues, um, but um, it's why we have not uh, ultimately uh, arrived at any sort of clarity around um, the backstop question around the single market 
customs union and the future relationship. Um, and I suppose we'll get into it in the panel discussion, but uh, I, like Alan Jukes, I'm a pessimist um, uh, when it comes to these negotiations, I have to say. Um, and I don't believe, and I know um, Dan O'Brien from the Institute has written consistently, and I've had many discussions uh, over the last year with him, uh, about this, the, the incompatibility of the two positions, the incompatibility of, on the one hand, the European Union position um, around both the Irish border and around the integrity of the single market and customs union and the UK position, which is um, at least verbally signing up to the backstop, certainly not, not substantively and not, not, um, not um, uh, as yet in any sort of binding legal text. Um, um, but 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 constantly um, sticking to the to the view that the UK must leave the single market and customs union must m be in a position to negotiate bilateral free trade agreements, um, take control of regulation and so on. Those two positions are incompatible, um, and unless there is a very considerable movement on one side or the other in the next few weeks, there will not be a deal. There can't be a deal, and uh, and that's why I'm somewhat pessimistic. I think there is a there is a, a fudge that can be found and. Um, you know, historically, that's what the EU has done. I was there uh, at EU Council meetings, at General Affairs Councils, right throughout the financial crisis, and that is how we dealt with the financial crisis. At every step, it was a fudge, and it had to be by necessity. Um, I'm not sure that that will be possible, given uh, the vitriol and given the intensity of the debate um, in the UK. I'm just not sure that it can be possible. And equally, I'm not sure that it will be, um, it will be compatible with the EU's priority of maintaining uh, 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 solidarity and cohesion within, within the bloc. Um, so that is the existential question that we face over the coming few, few weeks. It is ultimately, I think, an existential question that will fi face the Irish government more than any other. And I'm happy to elaborate on my thoughts on that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, but it's, it's one that um, will essentially see two very, very opposing uh, positions come head to head and, uh, and if one side or other does not give or cannot give and uh, does not ultimately find a way um, to fudge is probably the only word I can use to describe it, um, uh, the, the sort of the fundamental red line position, um, then I think we are facing no deal. And I'll leave it there and I'm happy to elaborate as we go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Dr. Kirsty Hughes, um, who's director at the Scottish Centre uh, for European Affairs. Okay, thank you very much for that, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Is this mic okay? Yes. You're, you're worried about the chair going down the crack or something? <laughs> it's a, meta it's a metaphor. <laughs> it's a metaphor for where my first sentence or question, which is where are we going next? Um, and as, as the previous speakers have already said, we're, we're facing extraordinary levels of uncertainty given, given the short time scale ahead uh, <laughs> till next March. Is there going to be a deal? Will it pass? Is there going to be a deal but it doesn't pass? Will there be no deal? And then what will happen? Or might there just, and I'm, I'm one of the, um, the, the more hopeful on this, might there even be no Brexit? Is, is that still possible and, and it's, it's interesting to, to note in case you didn't spot this one that a cross-party group of Scottish politicians have succeeded in getting a Scottish court reference to the European Court of Justice to ask whether Article 50 can be unilaterally withdrawn or not. Um, there's also this huge groundhog, groundhog day to, to Brexit. It, we just seem to go round and round and then the same issues come back up and I think you know by the start of September I was saying well at least things are going to go somewhere this autumn and then another month or so later and, and we still don't know the, the levels of uncertainty are maybe not going to go down that much by December but I think some of some of the scenarios will know which ones we look like we're heading into um, if there's a deal and it passes through Westminster and European Parliament European Council Brexit is actually going to happen but that means surely that there is at least an Irish backstop. We don't know still, we won't know what sort of future relationship. There could still be a cliff edge in December 2020, but it'll be a different cliff edge because there will be an Irish backstop. And we don't yet know how much that Irish backstop, if, if there's some sort of fudged customs union deal, may actually uh, implicitly or explicitly tell, tell us about the likely future UK relationship with, with the EU. Um, I think it's 
it's maybe stating the obvious, but I think we, we have to really remember that what in a sense is driving Brexit is not just that vote over two years ago. I think that UK politics is in, is in many ways imploding. It's failing. Um, at, at the very least, it's in a chronic crisis, and depending where these Brexit scenarios go next, we could soon be tipping into a very acute crisis. Um, it's quite extraordinary to see that the tourists, despite the fact that, that they're almost imploding, but not quite, despite the levels of infighting, despite the self-harm of Brexit, are ahead of Labour in the polls. It's quite extraordinary to see Labour in the last two years in many ways of being a really ineffective opposition, partly because they accepted the Brexit vote and, and partly because of the, the Eurosceptic leadership of, of the Labour Party. Um, if you followed the UK media, you might not notice that the SNP is the third party in Westminster because that, that seems to get very little attention, let alone the, the potentially quite crucial question of which way they may vote on, on any, any deal. Um, it's also interesting to note in, um, that whereas it used to be, if you looked at the Scottish polls on Brexit, that Labour and Lib Dem, Lib Dem voters were more remain, it's now actually the pro-independence voters, the SNP and Green voters in Scotland, who are more pro-remain even than the Labour and Lib Dems, that's sort of 80 and 90% for the Greens, and now strongly support a people's vote, something that Nicola Sturgeon and the leadership have so far been lukewarm on, but seem to be edging backwards slowly towards supporting. Um, Another thing to note for this autumn, and, and I was checking the latest YouGov polls, if you take out the don't knows, almost three quarters of the UK public, according to these polls, don't think there's going to be a deal in time to leave by next March. Now, I think there probably is going to be a deal, but I think that's absolutely fascinating. When you think um, of what's going to happen if there's a deal, we'll finally see May and the EU 27 speak from the same song sheet, if you like, and say, this is the deal it's, it's the best in the circumstances. We, we're urging all MPs to back it. Where will public opinion swing on that, and how might that impact on whether this thing goes through um, Westminster or not? Whether Labour, depending how soft it is, will, might Labour abstain or even vote for it? How many Brexiters will vote against? I would expect the SNP to vote against unless it's completely soft, but can we rule them out abstaining? And in all this discussion, coming back to the self-harm point, if there was some sort of goods free trade area, even if not as frictionless as Chequers, uh, uh, Chequers dream, if, if dreams or nightmare, um, it ignores the services sector. I mean, the degree of self-harm that is going on here, the 80% of our, our economy, the, the competitive bit of it and so on, is, is somehow just being hung out to dry. Um, very briefly, a, a couple more points. What happens if the deal doesn't pass at Westminster? I, I think at that point we tip, as I say, from chronic to acute crisis. Um, I think there are two possible options. There might be a general election. There might be a no-confidence vote at Westminster. Or there might be a second EU referendum. But again, that would need to get enough <coughs> votes at Westminster. There's, to my mind, a less likely option of Theresa May at that point going back and trying to negotiate something different, but what would the EU say? <laughs> There's a deal and, and, and that's it. Um, it's possible to imagine some of the Tory rebel Remainer MPs might prefer to vote for a people's vote, not for a general election. It's possible to imagine that there's no majority at Westminster for either of those things. So you reject the deal, you reject an election, you reject a people's vote, the crisis gets ever more extreme. At some point, surely, you must have an election, but if you have an election, it may not change anything. It's quite remarkable that the Tories are still ahead in the polls. You might get a Labour minority government. What will the SNP and Lib Dems, who are still there as a very small fourth party, demand, demand at that point? Um, at the moment, the British public of 54% remain. 77% of them think the negotiations are going badly, and yet in some polls there's still only 50-50 support for it a people's vote. I, I, so I, th I think it's a very hard political dynamic to predict. Where is Ireland in all this? It's, it's clear that Ireland has played this very bad hand we dealt you with a great level of diplomatic and political skill and strategy and I think great restraint as well. Um, there's going to be a lot of pressure, I think, obviously, even if from 
standing back a bit, but there will be a lot of pressure to try and get Westminster to pass the deal. There may be the sort of statements we've heard from the EU before, that, that, that there is no plan B, that there's a deal or, or no deal times running out. I do remember that back in the second Irish referendum on Nice, uh, Brussels saying there was no plan B, but there was a plan B, but I wouldn't encourage anyone on Brexit to, to be sure there's a plan B. Um, last couple of comments. I think, um, you know, as, as we've heard in some of the speeches already, uh, there's maybe a lot of uh, similarity in Scottish and Irish interests. Scotland is the, the, the most pro-Remain bit of the UK, but of course, as we get towards the deal, that might be different. Um, Ireland and the EU 26 as, as well will be wanting Westminster to vote for a deal, but if we're looking for a people's vote, I think the route to that has to be through, first of all, rejecting the deal. It has to be through a worsening of the crisis. If there's a deal and an Irish backstop, Scotland is going to say they want that too. However in, inappropriate that may be in many ways, and they're not going to get that, but they may certainly ask for that. Um, and Scottish independence is another topic for another day, but to think that Brexit won't impact on those political uh, dynamics in Scotland is, is not serious. I mean, it's not something that is necessarily going to shift things overnight, but I, I think it's not serious. Um, so I think either we see that, that there is a deal and it passes, Theresa May in some sense succeeds, and that means at least we shuffle out of the EU and out of your way, but we're still a very big player having a huge political crisis on, on the edge of Europe, trying to negotiate a future trade deal with you. Um, so, so it's not an end to uncertainty and crisis, especially not for those of us in the UK. If she fails, then there's very big risks ahead as the crisis turns acute. But there is also actually slightly more hope in my mind um, at this stage in the process. Um, with, with failure than success. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite Sebastian Gerhold, who is the senior advisor to the CDU CSU in the Bundestag. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, first of all, for, for having me. Here today, I particularly thank the Konrad Adenauer Foundation for obviously nominating me for this event and uh, thank the IIEA and the Scottish Centre on European Relations for agreeing on having among those uh, impressive panellists a lonely member of staff from the parliamentary group from Berlin. Um, I'm very happy to be here as I have a, a strong personalisation to all three of these nations, Germany, Scotland and, and Ireland, as you will see as I go along. Um, so that gives me the opportunity to apologize for my rocky uh, English. I'll just cling on to my notes a bit more than the other ones and hope I muddle through. Um, so the question we were asked today, I was asked today, where are we and where are we going? Well, where are we? We are in a, in a mess. Um, and I'm sure we can all agree on that. Um, I'd like to start with good news, though, as, as usual, I think one should. The um, Brexit process has encouraged my wife, who has been living in Germany for 15 years, but who is from County Down originally, to become German. So that's the good news for, for me. And with her come tens of thousands of Brits who live in Germany. And we are very grateful for, for this uh, influx into our uh, community in Germany. Um, well, the rest, I'm afraid, uh, pretty much are bad news. Um, Brexit is bad for the EU. We are losing um, economic, political, military power to a great extent. Um, it's uh, bad for the EU because we've got a shift of political balance away from the, the common sense, stability and growth orientated uh, northern nations towards the club met, quite frankly. That is also bad for Germany because it's bad for the EU. It's um, bad for Ireland, as most of you will know a lot better than I do. Um, and I believe it's catastrophic for the United Kingdom. But it was that, that decision, and as has been said here before, we respect the vote as it was cast. Um, it would be very tempting to think about and talk about why we are there, um, particularly for me as a historian who obtained his degree at Glasgow University 20 years ago. Um, 
but I'm not going to waste my time about that because it's, uh, at the end of the day it's futile. But it, is, it has got a lot to do with a demise of political culture, I believe, and of political leadership in the United Kingdom, um, a failure of the elites of the country to um, uphold an idea, I believe, that many of them were actually committed to. Um, but it also, I think, raises the question, or it's also got to do with the fact how we as the European Union in the future deal with different approaches to European integration. That's I'd like to come to later. Because we certainly did not manage that very well with the United Kingdom. It is true that we've heard complaints from London since the Treaty of Maastricht about the type of integration they were unhappy with. And I think the European Union should um, should try and, and uh, take up this question as well. Where are we going? Um, I, I thought I'd not get around at least <coughs> casting an, an, an attempt of, of an answer to the, the four of the frequently asked questions. Uh, will there be a deal? Yes, I believe there will be a deal. I would say 80% chance there will be a deal. Um, I've just come from Birmingham where I was gallivanting with uh, Felix Dane, and uh, I still believe there will be a deal. Um, I think it's more likely, not sure, but likely. Second question, would it be a good deal for the island of Ireland? <coughs> yes, I believe so. I'd say 95% probability it's going to be a good deal. It's not going to be like it used to be. Um, there is no good Brexit, that's certainly, certainly true. It's not going to be as good as it used to be. But I don't think the, the impact on, uh, on Ireland, on the political situation in particular, will be, will be disastrous. I think you've got a fair chance of getting out of that quite, quite well. And I'm really also very pleased how uh, the Europeans and the Germans as well have uh, stood by your side in this process. Um, will there be a second referendum? I personally don't think so. I think we've got maybe a 25% chance, maybe 30, because we, and, um, and it's been, been talked about before, we need a number of, of incidents on the way that would lead us to the opportunity of a second re referendum. And I can't see all of those happening yet. And the fourth question, will the European Union collapse within the next 10 years? No, it will not. No matter what the outcome of all this is, the European Union will still be there in 10 years. Um, I think it's late enough in the process to also think, no matter what the outcome is, what do we actually take away from Brexit? What's the lesson we learn? How can we do things better in the future, simply? Um, firstly, I think we need to prevent, we need to counter populism, left and right, and possibly center. That means simply good, hard political work, means you have to talk to constituents, you have to listen to constituents, you cannot taboo the obvious, um, but you need to stand up against nonsense. And I think that is also something that has not happened to the extent that would have been desirable in the United Kingdom over the past 10 years, um, and elsewhere, and elsewhere. I work in, in Parliament, I uh, know what I'm talking about. Um, and the second thing, I believe we need to address the question of the final destination of EU integration. Um, the ever closer union was a good idea and has taken us a long way. Look where we are, the, the level of integration we've got today. I believe when people agreed on the ever closer union, uh, it was not foreseeable and not foreseen how far that was taken us in a couple of decades only. Um, but I believe we need to respect national and cultural identity across Europe, and we need to respect those who want less than others, and need to, to address this question. I'm not saying we need to stop now, or we need to stop in five years' time, or in seven years' time, but I believe you should, should start thinking about that, and the, mm. the institutions who've organized this event today um, provide a room for that, for discussion, for, for an intelligent, intellectual discussion. Uh, also in a protected, uh, protected environment that's not necessarily in the tabloid newspapers. Um, 
So I think that's something we need to, to think about and talk about, no matter what the outcome of the Brexit process is, because that will be the question the European Union simply has to deal with over the next 10 years. And what we certainly need to do if we want to, the European Union to do well in the future, we need to always respect common sense. For example, we should never disconnect risk and responsibility think about financial matters, but also of about very other mat a lot of other matters. If we go along those, um, those lines, I think the Un European Union has got, uh, has got a bright future ahead of, of itself. Um, what we also need, I think, is, again, a more positive narrative of the European Union. And various suggestions have been made, Europe that protects, I'm, I'm, I think Europe is, European Union has more been about creating opportunities for people, opportunities for good education, opportunities for excellent business, for trade, opportunities for economic growth, for stability and peace. So I would, I would rather um, use the phrase, um, Europe can provide opportunities. And I think if that's the twist we get to the European uh, narrative for the next decade, uh, decade. I think we'll be doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have about uh, 13 minutes or so for questions, so if you have, just identify yourself. And if you're putting the question to one member of the panel, if you just mention that person. Yeah, Francis Jacobs. The question to Cassidy, if there was a people a people's vote. What would be the question? Would it be a binary question or would it be a multiple choice question? And secondly, you mooted the, I think, unlikely possibility of Article 50 being withdrawn. But what would happen then to the UK's current opt outs and refunds? Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. You've got a mic here. Yeah, sure. Um, they're very good questions. Um, I think re Remain has to be on the on, on the, the voting sheet if we're going to have a second referendum. And I don't, I you know, I don't know if we can get a vote through Westminster for a second referendum. But I suspect you can only get one through if it does have Remain on the ballot sheet. But obviously, Labour have been very uh, unclear on that. Um, but but if Labour couldn't provoke a general election, might they nonetheless? do it, um, might a vote for a, a second referendum lead May to then call a general election instead, you know, these, it, so it's all very unpredictable. I, I agree. I, personally, I'm not in favour of a, a three-way three -way vote. Um, people have suggested it could be the deal if there is one no deal and remain, but I think that risks giving you no majority on the first vote, and so, so that, you know, there's already, if you voted to stay in the EU and overturn the, the first result is going to leave bitter divisions. It's, even with a majority in England, it's not going to resolve the problems of English identity and, and, and the Tory politics that, that drive a lot of this. So I, I would rather see um, just just a, a deal or no deal, whichever it is, and, and remain in the EU. Um, certainly I heard John Kerr uh, in Glasgow this week at a Glasgow Brexit summit. Um, he, he's very strongly of the view that Article 50 can be unilaterally withdrawn. Uh, I know that legal opinion varies on that, and I've and I've always thought politically, anyway, if 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 Brexit was to be halted, it would need the political support of the EU 27, and I don't see how you win another referendum if if some of the members of the EU are saying well, we don't really want you back or we want you back without your existing opt-outs. Um, and that's why I think if we're to stop this, we need to stop it now. Some people in the UK, as you know, say that we should have a soft Brexit, then we can rejoin. I, I can't see the UK rejoining um, without its opt outs not for a very, very long time. Of course, there's also a possibility that a, that a people's vote would then deliver a, another leave vote. Um, that would then certainly have to be respected. Um, it might also deliver a remain vote at 50.5% to 49.5%, a very torn nation. Again, will the EU27 want us back at that point? Um, so I'm, I'm not saying it's just a, 
a magic wand, but I, I think in terms of the destructive power of Brexit, it's, it's one we shouldn't give up on yet. And, and just sorry, one last comment. I, I think what has happened in the UK in the last three months is a much more attention being given to a people's vote. People who a few months ago might have said 2% chance are now saying 20% chance. Okay, thank you. The lady over here. Yes. Just here. Hello, my name is Musisiwe. I am the member of the Institute. I just want to ask about uh, the Good Friday Agreement. Everyone appears to talk about it, that how important it is, that it's not uh, compromised in all this process. But no one really explains what are the elements which are, are so important in that Good Friday Agreement, where they cannot be uh, negotiated. Uh, like, I feel like uh, people who assume that everyone knows what is Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I'm only 16 years old in Ireland, but I try to read about it. And what I, f I find out that is that, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, people can, Good Friday, uh, Good Friday Agreement said people can either choose to be Irish or whatever, Scottish or whatever, they should be respected on that until themselves they decide whether they want to choose which side of the border they want to be. And no one is addressing well, anything. Let, about let, me, that. let me answer that for you myself, yeah. and I'll do it as quickly as I can. Yeah. Um, Northern Ireland was very unsettled yeah. from the time it was established in 1921. Yeah. And it was very unsettled because an element in the population was not treated equally with the other element in the population. There was a very nasty, and it was an exceedingly nasty, war. There's no other word for it. It was brought to an end by the two governments, essentially. And the essence was that there would be equality in Northern Ireland for both Catholics and Protestants. And the deal really is very simple. As long as there is equality for the minority, the minority are happy enough to stay within the United Kingdom. But if that equilibrium between the two sides is lost, and that's the real danger, then unfortunately we could go back, not to the way it was in the immediate past, but we could go back to a society which might be very unequal. I don't want to go into any more detail, if you don't mind. Next one here, Donald Denham. <coughs> Um, Sebastian Gerhold, you speak for me, and I thank you for, uh, for what you said. I have to say I don't agree, although I can understand it, I don't agree with the pessimism voiced by our own Irish politicians here today. Uh, it seems to me that there, there will be a deal on Brexit, that, that both the British and the, UK, uh, and the EU economies will continue to manage uh, and bump along. It may not be as good as it could have been predicted, but I don't believe it'll be as bad. There won't be any Armageddon uh, in store. Uh, my question is this. Uh, none of you who've spoken to date mentioned two words very common in the English language, and that is Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, there is an alternative to Theresa May, although her Weakness, her weakness is her strength, I believe, and she'll certainly, I think, carry on for some time. But surely there's the prospect of a Labour government in the UK and that that will have uh, a consequence on Brexit. Do you want to answer that, um, Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not as sanguine as you about the economic damage. If, if you know, one of the figures I've quoted repeatedly, um, but it should be taken very seriously as the National Institute for Economic and Social Research in London did a very detailed look at the Canada trade deal, South Korea and so forth, and at how, sorry, at how less integrated um, Canada's services trade especially is and goods trade with the EU than the UK and suggested that under a Canada-style deal, UK services trade with the EU would fall 60%. So, I mean, that's just, you know, one example. If, if we have a, a Canada-style deal, we can't expect the car manufacturers to stay and, and so on. So on, on Jeremy Corbyn, I think it's quite extraordinary that, that the Tories are 6% or so ahead in the polls at the moment. I think, I think if there was a second 
vote a people's vote, you couldn't just say you were going back to the status quo. You'd have to tackle some of the inequality and poverty that drove part of that vote. So if Jeremy Corbyn suddenly had a sort of um, you know, blinding revelation that, that actually the EU wasn't such a terrible thing and could offer a change to the status quo and a fight to stay in the EU, I'd, I'd be seriously interested. But I, I think at the moment it doesn't look like we're heading for a Labour government, though we, we might be. And what Jeremy Corbyn wants to do is going to be made much more difficult um, by Brexit, though, though, of course, they seem to think they can negotiate a, an almost soft Brexit. But I'm one of the minority of people, I think, seem to be in a minority in the UK, who think a soft Brexit is not sustainable. I can't see how the UK could stay for a long time in a situation where the EU decided its trade policy, its regulatory policies, and, and so forth. Um, so, so I'm not sure there is any easy way out here, and in that sense I do, do agree with Neil Richman, there are no good Brexit. Thank you. Would you like to add? Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to have a chat with Donald <coughs> to, to understand the basis for his optimism, but uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sh I, I, knowing Donald, I'm sure it's a it's, uh, it's very valid um, perspective. Um, on Jeremy Corbyn, um, I, I actually wrote my column in the Times last week about Jeremy Corbyn. That's the Times of London, not the Irish Times, to clarify. <laughs> Contentious one. Um, I, uh, I, I, I mean, it's just an, it's, it's an imponderable. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is a, is a more hardened Eurosceptic than the people who delivered us Brexit, Brexit, David Cameron and co. Jeremy Corbyn has voted against every single step of not just European integration as we understand it today, and as Sebastian has talked about, you know, ever closer union and the sort of the deeper political integration, but every step of it. I mean, he opposed the single market. He is fundamentally opposed to the liberal economic model upon which uh, global economics, global trade, and the European Union are based. So, I mean, this is a guy who believes in his heart and soul that this is a terrible thing. Um, and I feel sorry for, for, for some of the people who I ex respect and admire in the, in the Labour Party, um, the moderates who are the majority. Um, at least in the parliamentary party, um, not in the momentum movement and so on. Um, because he doesn't represent them. He, he doesn't have the support, as we, as we know, as we understand, of his parliamentary party. And that is why British business has been so quiet about Brexit. They are afraid to speak up about the potential for Armageddon, and there is real potential for Armageddon. It's on our doorstep, as far as I'm concerned. But they're afraid to speak up about it because they're afraid of what might come in, in, in place of Theresa May if she loses... Um, a, a vote of confidence and, and, and it triggers a, an election in the UK. They're worried about uh, a John MacDonald... Chancellor, exactly. A collectivist, um, you know, wealth tax, uh, Marxist agenda. And these are people who, who laud Marxism and Leninism. You know, this is what we're dealing with at the top of the Labour Party. So there is no opposition. There is no alternative um, to Brexit because there's nobody um, in a senior position in the British Labour Party advocating it. It is a tragedy and I genuinely believe that whatever had happened in the vote in 2016 and I think it was inevitable and I was one of the few people who predicted it, I knew Brexit was going to happen because I was watching this circus in the UK for the previous number of years and dealing with my colleagues in the, Labour, in, in the, in the Conservative Party uh, through the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and through the EPP originally and so on. So I knew, what, I saw what was happening. But, the, but, but I actually think that there could have been a huge amount of damage limitation in the last two years if there were an actual opposition in the UK. And we still, and we saw even the pathetic fudge last weekend at the Labour Party conference, where still we see no leadership, a complete dearth of leadership from the main opposition party. And unfortunately for the SNP in the Westminster context, they cannot fill that vacuum. And clearly, as we saw in the last general election, the Lib Dems, who are the only sort of uh, option if you're, if you're a moderate pro-European voter in England now, uh, also can't fill that vacuum. The only people who could potentially give that leadership are the Labour Party, and they can't with their current leadership. So it's, it's catastrophic as far as I'm concerned. Very sad. Uh, and it actually, as you can probably see, it makes me quite emotional actually talking about it because unfortunately for all of us we are the recipients of this dysfunctional politics in the UK at the moment. I'm sorry we have to come to an end because we've reached the end of our time. There are four or five of you who wanted to ask questions. I'm sorry we just didn't get around to it. Thank you very much indeed. All three.